really a grand opportunity uh, to be strengthened in the faith and to realize some things uh, that are that are eternally true, that are very, very important. Last week as we were in Daniel chapter 9, uh, we saw the 70 weeks of Daniel and we understood that a week is a measure. A week is a measure. What is it a measure of? Yeah, it's a measure. Uh, or what 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 uh, number is it a measure of? One. Oh boy, Frank. Seven. Yeah, a week is a measure of seven. Let me turn the volume down. It seems as though I am hearing myself a little bit too well. Okay, so a week is a measure of one. A week is used in the scripture and in this and in, particularly in this context. It's used uh, much the way we would use a term like a couple. How many's a couple? How many is a few? Okay, a couple's two. A few is three or more. A uh, dozen? Five. Five. Yeah, thanks, Joel. <laughs> a dozen is twelve, right? A week? Seven. Okay. Now, it's important for us, and I want to point out something here because um, oftentimes we don't think very much about things that are oftentimes that we think or that we say, we don't think all the way through things. If, you, if you're a thinker and you ponder things, you'll understand some... Um, you'll understand how important it is to learn Bible truth. One of the things that's done today when people don't understand the Scripture is to rewrite the Scripture in a way that makes it more simple. Anybody ever heard this before? In other words, many times I've opened up my King James Bible and... Uh, Try to show somebody something. They're like, I can't. I don't use the King James Bible, and they say uh, it's it's just too hard to understand. Anybody ever heard somebody say that? Uh, you know, it's just got it's got words in it I don't know, and it's I've heard people say it's Elizabethan English. Well, let's deal, let's talk about that just for a second, shall we? Be a good idea to th talk about. It. I'll tell you what. If you if you've said that, and if you thought that, you're wrong. You're wrong. Yeah, it, it does predate Elizabethan English, but it's very interesting if you read Elizabethan literature or even English literature that is contemporary with the printing of the King James Bible. It's very interesting that when you read that literature that it doesn't sound like the Bible either. The fact is, is the Bible is a very unique book because God used a nation called Israel and they were Hebrews and they spoke a Hebrew language. In the Old Testament of the Scriptures, Hebrew... But the New Testament of the Scripture was penned using Hebrew, using Hebrew authors, men who knew Hebrew. And they were Israelites. And many of the things that are saying, <coughs> for instance, uh, holy, holy, holy. It's a Hebraism. In other words, in the Hebrew language, if a person said something three times, it was said for emphasis. You ever have somebody say, wow? Listen to this. Okay. Wow. Okay, how about this? Wow. Just wow. Which has more emphasis? The second or the first use of wow? Second. Okay, watch this. Wow. 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 Okay, which one has more emphasis? The last one, right? In other words, to say holy, holy, holy is to emphasize the very awesome holiness of the supernatural characteristic of God. And that's a tool of Hebrew, of the Hebrew language. When our Bible, the King James Version, was translated, that was retained in it. Other versions let things like that go. In other words, they try to make it sound like American English. It's kind of tough to sound like American English. Did you know that? Why would that be hard? Why would it be hard to make something sound like American English? Yeah, America is a melting pot of nations. We have so many words in our language that are Spanish, that are French, that are Italian, that are uh, Latin, that are Greek, that are... Uh, and you could just go on and on and on and on with all the languages that have influenced the, the English language. The fact of the matter is, is that American English is different than British English or any of the United Kingdom variances of the English language. Why? Because Americans are a diverse group of people. If you were to try to make the Bible fit all the diversity, 
in our nation, you would lose uh, you would lose a lot of the specific things that are preserved in the Scripture. But not only that, not only would you lose things, but you wouldn't possibly be able to have a book that um, speaks to everybody on the basis of their lingo or terminology. The Bible is not a book of lingo. It's the Word of God. And it is divinely preserved as such. Okay, so it's important for us when somebody says something like, well, you know, I don't like that copy of the Scripture because it's hard to understand. To understand the root behind it. Why would something be hard to understand? Okay, you can't comprehend. And why might a person not comprehend? They weren't taught. They don't know the words. They don't know the words. Okay, so... Can you imagine if I tried to teach Sunday school? It's not a bad idea, but could you imagine if I tried to teach Sunday school only on the level of the minimum or on the, of the maximum of every person here? In other words, what every person here could understand, if you don't understand it, I can't talk about it. How much would you learn if I didn't tell you anything you didn't already know? Not a thing in the world, right? It's amazing when you approach the Bible with an attitude that says, I don't want to learn anything. Listen, if you don't know a word, learn it. I don't mean to be unkind, but if I don't know something, it means I need to learn it, not I need to take it out of the Bible. But that's the approach to modern translation. If I don't understand it, take it out. Don't learn it. Dumb it down. Make it simpler. Well, the problem is, is that if I do that on the basis of every generation on every level, over a period of time, how much will I have left? Folks, we're not getting smarter, unfortunately. Uh, our language isn't getting better. You know that it used to be that an educated person, uh, for instance, you could use the... Yes, you have some? Oh, okay. That an educated person uh, would, who is considered to be educated, like say the Wesleys, Charles and John Wesley, their mother Susanna taught them, you know how many languages by the age of 13 they had a grasp of? They would have been fluent in English. It's their native language. They would have been fluent in Greek. They would have been fluent in Latin. They would have been fluent in Hebrew. And uh, they'd also have known many of the European languages. Italian, French, and so on and so forth. By the time they were 13, they would have been grammarians. I'm not talking about they could speak the language. I'm talking about they could write it properly. There's a big difference, isn't it, between being able to talk the vernacular of the day and being able to understand the grammar behind it. When they would go to college, when a young person would go to college and study, they already had foundational. They already had foundational thing. I mean, they didn't go to school for grammar. They already had grammar by the time they were 13. In other words, they were studying things like the scriptures and the writings and. I mean, they were, they were deep into things. The foundation was already set and already established. Their college age would have been from ages, uh, say, 13 to 19. And so, my question oftentimes when I look back at predating them and looking at the times of even the translators of the Scripture, of the King James Bible that we have today, the question I oftentimes have is, does there exist on a singular level, is there a single person who is as educated as the massive group that God used to translate the Scripture. I don't want to get in. We're not going to. We're not talking about why we use the King James Bible today and all that. We're not going to go there because we don't have time for it. It's not the topic. But I do want us to understand something. The Bible is very, very specific. It's it is promised by God to be preserved, and as such, it's very important that we understand that the words of the Scripture are important, and the word weak is a word that we don't use much. Matter of fact, I meant to do this last week, which is a, a last uh, period of seven days. I wanted to go to Dunkin' Donuts and order a week's worth of donuts. And I, I didn't do it for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> One, I didn't want to eat donuts last week. Uh, and if I'd ordered a week's worth, I'd have had to eat at least seven of them. Right? But I just wanted to do it because I want to popularize the word. And again, here's a little word to our millennials our young people. Let's start using the word weak. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, bring it up again. A lot of people don't know. My generation doesn't know what the word weak means. They don't know that it means seven. We think a week means a, 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 a section 
of the yearly calendar, a section of seven days, uh, which it could be a week of days, but it's a week of days. Not, but we could have a week of minutes, a week of seconds, a week of months, and so forth. Everybody get that? Okay, so we established that last week. It's important. Why? Well, because honestly, if you don't know what the week means, Daniel 9 makes no sense. Last week also, we established the importance of understanding that when Daniel had realized, based on Jeremiah 29, based on Jeremiah 25, when he had realized that the 70 years he'd spent in captivity fulfilled the prophecy that Jeremiah prophesied about the captivity, Daniel understood that the time period was finished. It was up. It was done. And therefore, his physical requirement for captivity was fulfilled. It's important to realize that because who are we if Daniel interpreted the Scripture literally? In other words, Jeremiah said 70 weeks, or 70 years, not 70 weeks. Who are we if Daniel understood the Scripture to be literal? And if God's response to Daniel was the Scripture is literal, who are we to say, well, it's allegorical? You know, it's an allegory. The 70 years represent something. No. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that this is not an allegory of, you know, God randomly gave us the number 490 and it doesn't mean anything actually. Jesus could have been born at any time and Jesus could have been crucified at any time. doesn't mean anything. In other words, isn't it nonsensical to realize that Daniel believed the Scripture was literal? God spoke to Daniel in literal terms. And then now people say, well, you know, this covenant with Israel. I don't, I, I'm bashing individuals that are rapture deniers. They deny the, 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 the snatching up or the taking away. Uh, individuals who say that today they believe that we are in the kingdom, Christ's kingdom. There's some literal events that must take place that have not taken place. And so this is how we understand the Scripture. So we approach the Scripture literally. All right, there is a literal method <coughs> behind the seven or the 70. What are the 70 years? Why, was, why are there 70 years of, of captivity? Everybody have your chart, this chart here? See on the top left-hand corner, the 70 Sabbath violations? Let's go there. Let's go to Leviticus 26 and, uh, and 2 Chronicles 36. Leviticus and uh, <coughs> chapter 26. By the way, this chart is hot off the press, and so it has not been proofread. So, <laughs> hopefully it's accurate. <laughs> but it's not accurate on the, on the terms of the Scripture, I'll tell you that. <coughs> Leviticus 26, and uh, let's look at verse 34. Uh, then shall the land enjoy your Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even shall the land rest, and enjoy your Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelled upon it. Okay, so this is God, if you read the whole text up to this point, God is saying, this is what will happen to you if you do not keep the Sabbaths. I'm going to send you into captivity, and the land is going to be dormant. I will have the land have its Sabbaths. Now, there are a lot of Christians that want to get scientific about the Sabbath thing. In other words, they say, well, you know, there's not a, uh, you know, there's a, there's a uh, it's not the principle behind it. It's the fact that it's good for land to have a resting period every seven years. And that's a fact. My, my grandfather is a farmer. My dad's a farmer. And uh, we come from a family of farmers. And one of the things that's really interesting and very difficult to do is to leave a field unplanted for a season. Why is it hard for a farmer to leave a field unplanted? Well, there's no yield in it. You're not going to make anything. But it's amazing. I remember one year my grandpa let a field sit and it grew up with all kinds of weeds in it. Then he dissed it, plowed it, tilled it. And the next year it produced the best crop of any of his land. Just from sitting a year, from resting for a year. But I'm going to just tell you something. That isn't the reason that the Scripture says that the land has to be set aside. It's a faith at issue. It's a faith matter. It's a matter of trusting God and saying, I can give this to God because God wants a Sabbath. He wants a rest. And by the way, is it hard to rest? Resting is a matter of faith. 
Resting is a matter of trusting that you're going to be taken care of in spite of the fact that you're not doing anything to care for yourself. It's a matter of faith. And God wanted the children of Israel to demonstrate faith. He said, hey, listen, if you, if you don't commit idolatry, if you keep the law, if you do these things, I'm going to send you an early and a latter rain. In other words, you're going to have rain early, you're going to have rain late, which means you're going to have a great harvest. Most important times to water is when a crop is first planted and when before a crop yields its fruit. Uh, that's the best time to water. And God said, oh, you don't need to irrigate. I'll give you an early rain and a latter rain. Promised rain from God. That's pretty good, isn't it? Who else has that? I know it's going to rain because God said so. And then God said, I will make your crops good enough that after six years, you can rest the land for a year. Uh, but these greedy individuals had an idea. They said, you know, if we don't rest the land, we'll get extra. But see, the problem is they forgot why their crops were good to begin with. It's because God made them good. And God said, I want the Sabbath. And Israel had 490 years of no Sabbaths, no resting the land. And it was a pure thing. You know, everybody looked over, hey, he's not resting his land. He's not resting his land. He's not. Everybody's going to get ahead of me. I'm going to be poor as dirt by uh, next year. I'm going to be poor as Job's turkey. Uh, the By the time... Uh, you know, the year comes around, I'll have eaten up everything I have. He'll have planted, he'll have a harvest, he'll have a yield. My neighbor's going to be more wealthy than I am. Well, humanly speaking, a guy who is working when everyone else is resting, is he going to have more or less? Humanly speaking, he's going to have more. But how about when, we come, when it comes down to faith? My friend, you cannot quantify God's blessing. You can't quantify it. I have in my life experience so many times that faith yields blessing. That there's no doubt in my mind. It's, it's not even surprising. It's not even a unique thing. You know, there are a lot of Christians who don't tithe. And they don't give offerings. And the reason is because they, don't, they think they don't have enough to do it. But it's absolutely incredible that they don't understand that the very reason they don't have enough is because they don't give God what He deserves. And so they, humanly speaking, are working harder. And humanly speaking, they ought to have more. But the problem is, is that actually speaking, they don't. Why? Because they don't account for God's blessing. And God's blessing, my friend, is real. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and He addeth no sorrow with it. That's what God does. So the national Israel, I can give a lot of reasons for it, but God, hey, the best reason to do something is because God said so. By the way, it's a good way for you and I to begin our understanding of what we ought to do as a as believer. Listen, if God's Word indicates that we ought to do it, we just should do it. We can search the Scripture and find out the reason. The real reason is because it demonstrated faith to God. And Israel, Israel didn't trust God. They didn't rest their land on the Sabbath day. And so, after 490 years of it, God said, you know something? That land's going to get a rest whether you give it or not. I'll tell you what. That land could rest if it didn't have all of you living on it. I'll send you somewhere else. Go to Babylon. Second uh, Chronicles 36, 1. 21, I meant to say. Second Chronicles 36 and chapter 20 or chapter 36 and verse 21. I'll keep saying it until I get there. I'm there. Okay. Uh, we could read. Verse 18, All the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of God, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. This is speaking of, <coughs> of uh, when Zedekiah was taken in uh, to Babylon. The king of the Chaldeans cut, uh, captured them. Verse 19, They burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burn all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Why the captivity? Why the captivity? Because God's people didn't rest the land and God said, okay, you're going to rest the land whether you choose to or not. All right. So we're clear about it, right? The 70 years that uh, Daniel was in captivity. 
Uh, do everybody see in this chart, we have then the reason for captivity. Why were there 70 weeks of captivity? Uh, or I'm sorry, why, why 70 years here in Daniel chapter 9? Well, for 490 years, Israel had not rested the land. Okay, so you have six days in a year, and you have or six days uh, until the Sabbath, and you have a seventh day. Let's, let's just do the math. 490 uh, divided by 70. Seven. Yeah, seven, right? <clears throat> so uh, that's how many. There were 70. There were 70 years of Sabbaths that had not been kept or fulfilled. And God kept all of them. <laughs> he just sent this. He said, okay, y'all, you know, I've got, there's been 70 uh, times that the land should have rested over 490 years. And so, here's what we're going to do. You're going to go into captivity and the land's going to rest for 70 years. We're going to catch up on the Sabbaths. Now, is that the best thing for the land? No. Actually, it's not, is it? Do you think that the land, after sitting for 70 years, was in better or worse shape than it was? I mean, do you think they tilled it one time and boom, it had 70 Sabbaths worth of resting and yielded the crops that were proportionate? You know, they had <coughs> guys planted beans and got the bean stalks that Jack found, you know, and planted <laughs> later. Is that what happened? No. You know what happens with 70 years of dormancy? Well, you have, in some places, you have terrible overgrowth. And uh, you have plants that grow and actually deplete the soil. They don't add any, give anything to the soil. There's no crop rotation. There's no husbandry. The other thing that happens is that you have runoff. This is a terrible thing on hilly ground, much like Israel would have had. You have water, rain that runs, and there's no terracing. There's no tilling. There's nothing to protect the land. And so when the rain runs, the, the, it just erodes. And the soil erodes, and the, the topsoil which is the best of the soil, comes off. And so you have eroded soil. Israel today looks, the parts that they are rebuilding, recovering, look beautiful, I'm told. But most of Israel, before they go and rework, it looks like a desert. I mean, it just, it looks uh, very infertile. You look at pictures of Israel, it's just rocky. And you think of it as land flowing with milk and honey, and you're like, how in the world? From a farmer's perspective, it does not look like a dream. Iowa looks like a dream from a farmer's perspective. Okay? Now everybody understands that then. So then we have 70 years of captivity. And uh, let's go to Daniel chapter 9. We'll read that. We'll read some of the specific things uh, that we began to look at <coughs> last week. We had 70 years of captivity, which represented the 490 years, or which made up for the 490 years, that the land was not rested, or did not have its Sabbaths every seventh year. Anybody have any questions about what we've covered so far? Have I been? Am I, what's, the, what's the significance of the rest? Faith. So they were just. So what was the reason for the 70 years captivity? They hadn't rested the land for 490 years. So over 490 years, there should have been 70 years of rest. What does it mean to rest the land? Not plant it. Okay. It actually means take a vacation. It means every seven years you get a year off. And God's going to take care of you. That's nice, actually. Don't you think? You know, how many of you don't have time? You know, just don't have time. Why don't you have time? Because you're always working, trying to do things that just have to be done. And God said, trust me, every seven years, don't work the land. Now, it doesn't mean you don't eat. doesn't mean you don't do other things. But I'll tell you what, if you are a tiller of the land and you spend you know, the seasons of the year working the ground and you take a year, a year of not doing that, it would be kind of nice. Um, I guess we don't have time for this, but I'll share it with you. I have always believed that a Christian should trust God by faith was taught that by my parents. My, my, my dad always was a giver. And uh, he always gave whether he had anything himself or not. In other words, he never decided whether he could give on the basis of his bank account. He decided whether he could give on the basis of whether um, there was a need. I remember sitting, even in high school, I remember 
sitting in church business meetings and um, people talking about, well, we need a van. I'm looking around and thinking how many people there were more wealthy than my dad. Nobody knew it. They thought my dad was wealthy. And the reason they thought he was wealthy because he went again. I remember my dad saying, well, I found this and well, if nobody else will, I'll, give, I'll, I'll buy that van and give it to the church. And I remember thinking, I know he doesn't have the money to do that. <laughs> but he always figured out a way without going into debt or doing anything. He just figured out a way to give stuff. And it's always amazing because my dad always had stuff. Never lacked it, but he could always give it. Always give it. When I was in... Uh, so when I knew it was time to go to Christian college, I had some principles that were instilled in me by my parents and by my teachers. And one of the things was don't go into debt. I remember going to Bible college and not having enough money for Bible college. So you know what I did? I worked really hard. I saved everything I could. I gave to the Lord. And guess what? In four years, I graduated from Bible college with no debt. I can't tell you how I did. I'm just telling you God did it. I can tell you all kinds of events that transpired where God made sure my need was provided. Just took care of my need. Didn't have, I wasn't one of the guys in prayer group in college that raised my hand and said, pray for me. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bill. Never told anybody whether I could pay my bill or not. Didn't, you know, what that means is, hey, call home and ask your parents if they'll pay for my bill or if any of you have money. You know, a lot of times when we pray, share financial needs with other people, a lot of times what we're actually doing is we're asking that person to take care of our financial need. But you can just pray and ask God about your financial need and not tell anybody and you'd be surprised at how God will supply it. That's what He does. Um, when I graduated from college, I ended up in Delray Beach, Florida working at the summer day camp. Dr. McClure asked me to be his assistant pastor and I prayed about whether the Lord wanted me to do that. We didn't discuss salary. Uh, and I, and I, I prayed about it and I came back and told Pastor McClure, you know what, these would be the things that I believe would be right. The Lord had us to do that. Then Pastor McClure said, you know, I don't think we can pay you much. And I said, well, I don't really care about that. So the church decided to pay me $125 a week. And Pastor said, of course I don't expect you to live on that. I think, you know, it would be perfectly fine with me if you found a job and were bivocational. Well, I believe the Lord wanted me to be full-time. I'd, been, I'd done other things, and I wanted to be in the ministry, and so I didn't work a job. And guess, guess what? 125 a week was plenty. And God just used so many things in my life. I mean, it just increased things. I saved enough money in uh, six or eight months' time to buy an engagement ring. Um, how are you going to get married on a salary of $125 a week? Well, get a wife that has a good job. That's how. Um, <laughs> But God took care of our needs. We were saving for seminary and uh, went back to seminary by faith. Didn't have a way to pay for seminary. I didn't have it all. I had it a lot. I had a lot saved for seminary, but ended up our church needed it. And so we gave it to the church. And so we went to seminary, didn't have much, and God supplied that. Supplied the need for it and supplied it through work. A lot of times we supplied it. We started our church and we had money saved to start our church and some events transpired where we were taken advantage of financially by some people and lost a great deal. And uh, some events transpired where uh, we were going to live in our motor home and we had the engine go out on it and I had to spend the money rebuilding the engine I was going to use for startup expenses for our church. You know what? God took care of that. Our first year in our ministry, uh, I didn't work a job. I didn't get paid anything. Our church didn't pay me anything. And guess what? I made it through that year. And if you were there, you know God just used all kinds of people, all kinds of things to meet my needs. Second year, same thing. Third year, I made $1,000. How many of y'all can live on $1,000 for three years? Two of those years, I had, a, I had a mortgage payment. Is that possible? It's not possible, is it? But God supplied our needs. I ain't going to borrow money from somebody somewhere and say, hey, you know, i I got I to have some money to live on. God supply my needs. And He always has when I've demonstrated faith. And this is the issue, Joel. That's the, that's the answer to the question. The problem that Israel had was a faith problem. They knew what God wanted, but they wouldn't do it. And so God did to them what He told them He would do. And so they went into the captivity. Okay. Now, we are in today's text, remaining years until the covenants are fulfilled. You see this in the 70 weeks explained, top of the thing, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. <coughs> uh, verse 24 
We, we last week saw that Gabriel was sent to give an answer to Daniel. Verse 24, <clears throat> Seventy weeks are determined on thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. One, two, three, four, five, six purposes for 70 weeks in verse 25 of Daniel <coughs> chapter 9. In other words, God is indicating to Daniel, yes, Daniel, indeed, there are 70 literal years that you have to rest before uh, the, you're free to return from the captivity. But, God said, there's 70 weeks until these six things are done. And my friend, if you look at these things that need to be done, they're not finished yet. Which helps us to understand the question Daniel would have if he were in our shoes. Okay, if the 70 weeks have to be fulfilled, if this is a prophecy of future weeks, then what is God doing in the meanwhile? Well, God's going to explain that. Look at verse 26. After three score and two weeks. What's a score? 20. How many are three scores? 60. How many are three score plus two? 62. How many are three score plus two and uh, seven? 54. <coughs> Thanks, Frank. All right. Last week we asked Frank what's 70 minus 69, and he came up with 10. Was it 10? <coughs> Yeah, so he's he's on the ball today. You had your insulin, huh? I did. Yeah, good. Just kicking it. Okay. <laughs> now, we see that there are some things that are going to happen, first of all, that are required. One is that after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And <clears throat> so we see a period of years until uh, the Messiah would be cut off. Now, we see here as well that the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, <coughs> desolations are, con are determined. Now verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to, to cease. What is... How many, how many years are in a week of years? Come on, Joel. We don't have time for this. Seven. seven. What's half of a seven? Three and a half. Three and a half. This is the midpoint of the tribulation, this final week. Now we see that there is a time that until the prince is going to come. So we ask the question, a practical question, how did the 46 wise men who followed the star, the 46 wise men who followed the star, how did they know that Christ would be born? What? By the time. Yeah, they read Daniel. They read Jeremiah. They knew what Daniel said. What's the question, Mrs. Dollins? Why 46? Because I don't like three, so I just use the word 46. <laughs> You're just trying to make sure we're all white. Right yeah, I was seeing if anyone was paying attention. Thank you for paying attention. <laughs> there were three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but the Bible doesn't say how many men came from the east. And it would be very, very uncommon for three men to travel. In other words, you would travel in a, in a major party. And so it, it very likely was not three wise men, although it looks cute in a manger scene. Uh, it very likely was not three wise men, so I think it's 46. Okay. I just like 46. Isn't that a good number? Anybody here 46? No, you're all older than that. Yeah, yeah it's good for Joel. Okay, so 46 is a good number. Anyone want to vote on it? Anyone want to throw out a better number for wise men? What would be your preferred number? 47. Seven? Seven? You'd like a week's worth of wise men? Okay. Well, all in favor? We seven kings of Orient are trying. Uh, Still sounds better than 46. Okay. How did they know? How did the seven wise men know that <laughs> Christ would be born? Because they read the prophecy. They read the prophecy of the Scripture and believed it. Yes, ma'am. Because they did when the first... Dis not dispensation, but the first deportation happened. Right. They knew 
when the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was. And that's what we're going to look at now. Okay. I have here a book that every student of the Scripture should own even if you don't read. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't... Actually, I want to be careful about this. This is a very good book, very helpful book. The best book I believe I've read 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 a lot of books on the um, dates of Christ. This book, uh, Doctor Harold Honer, who has written probably the best commentary there is on Ephesians. By the way, I'm not a common, I'm not I'm not big into commentaries and all these things, but this guy's done some reading and spent a life of research. One of the things he early on in his uh, in in seminary was one of his major dissertations was the date of Christ's birth. Um, and then he, the commencement of Christ's ministry. A lot of people are confused over how many years were in Christ's ministry. And so he deals with dates and calendars and proves from the Scripture how many years uh, Christ's ministry was. So the date of his birth, the commencement of Christ's ministry, the duration of Christ's ministry, the day of Christ's crucifixion, which was on a Friday, and the doctrinal, biblical explanation for that, as well as the year of Christ's crucifixion. He takes calendars and explains, using the calendars and using the Scripture, how we can know for sure when Jesus was born and how we can know for sure when Jesus died. I want to ask you a question. Is it important for us to know for sure when Christ was crucified? Yeah. Why? No. Why is it not important? Because we just have to know He did and He was risen. You can be saved knowing He did, but if you don't know when He did it, the problem is you're casting down on whether He did it. In other words, today we have... Yeah, well, I'll, I'll explain that. Today we have a real issue, we have a real problem with people that don't even know that Jesus was born. Now, it's not a historical anomaly. Or it's not a historical debate. All you have to do is read contemporary writings and you see that Jesus was born. The rabbis who did not believe in Jesus, Josephus, who would not have been uh, probably a believer, everyone who wrote the history of the time period acknowledged that Jesus Christ was born. But today we have people that don't even know if Jesus did or not. Well, I would say to you that anytime there is a casting of doubt on something, the purpose behind it is to undermine the whole purpose. In other words, one who doesn't know when Jesus is born also doesn't know if Jesus was born. Get this? No, there's, it's not. It's not. You know, I can't sleep at night if I don't know whether or not Jesus was crucified on a Friday. It's not a matter of that. But my friend, casting doubt is to cast doubt. The reality of it is that the Scripture is written very specifically on purpose, and it is not so that you know God can. Um, we have to be careful not to give God wiggle room. God doesn't need wiggle room. He's God. And what the Scripture prophesies comes to pass when and as God's Word says. And so it's very important for us as believers to know that we're not following a cunningly devised fable. The apostles were eyewitnesses of the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, it isn't everybody's duty to study, <clears throat> as Dr. Harold Honer has, and find out specifically the year that Christ was born and find out specifically the year and the day that He died, but it's possible. And it's important for us to know when people start to beat up on Christmas. Hey, this whole Christmas thing right now that's going on in Christianity, not in the world. In Christianity, oh, you know, Christmas is a pagan holiday. I take exceptional exception to that. Jesus was born on December the 25th. I'm telling you, He was. You, you say, Pastor, you don't know that. Well, it would take a very long time for me to go through everything that it takes to explain it. But Dr. Harold Honer actually wrote a great and, to me, completely acceptable explanation with evidence, both biblically and extra-biblically, to the day that Christ was born, using known dates and using the Scripture's references to those dates, you can know when Christ is born. Today we have history revisionists in Christianity who try to explain why the sheep, the shepherds, would not have kept their sheep at the time of the year that, that uh, we think that Jesus was born. And yet, uh, contemporary writings very, very plainly evidence that we can know to the date, to the time that Christ was born. Come on in, guys. Good to see you. <coughs> okay? So, um, the fact of the matter is, is that 
On the one hand, what you believe is because of doubt. In other words, I doubt that could have happened. I don't see how anybody could have known that. And so we're going to take the position of doubt versus what we've known. You know what Christians always celebrated? Christmas. And always celebrated the resurrection on the Lord's Day. It's those, those things, Easter and Christmas are not, and I use the term Easter, it's okay, are not dates to be doubted. You say, Pastor, uh, you'd have to prove it to me. Well, uh, I don't have time, but there's a pretty short book. You could read this in a day if you were a, a steady reader. You could read it in a month if you studied it. But it's Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Harold Honer. And uh, I would say there would be things that perhaps in it I would disagree with. But I promise you the people that are detractors are not using more sources and are not approaching it more open-mindedly and uh, are not... Um, and uh, are are not considering the things that could be considered. Whereas it takes no, no scholarship at all to doubt or to derive, does it? What do, we do, what do we do if we don't agree with someone? The best illustration this year is Chris Christie and Marco Rubio. Let's dispense with the notion that Obama doesn't know what he's doing. Obama knows exactly what he's doing. That's right. And Chris Christie says, All you are is a strung together series of talking points. You just keep saying the same thing over and over. You just have a rehearsed uh, line of talking points. And, and Obama says, or, and then Christie says, or not Christie, Rubio says, but Obama does know what he's doing. And Christie says, see, you said it again. And he said, but I said, Obama knows what he's doing. See, you said it again. And everybody's like, ha, 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 ha. He keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Because it's a very good point. In other words, if you can't make fun of the point that Rubio makes, make fun of him for making the point. Let me ask you a question. Is it important to realize that Obama's not an idiot? A lot of people think he's just stupid. He's not stupid. And that's a valid point. In other words, what he is doing is on purpose deliberately trying to destroy our country. And that matters. But Chris Christie made fun of him, and so the point is just thrown away with. If you can't beat a guy with an argument, beat him by making fun of him. He's got big ears. That's how he made... I mean, he just destroyed Rubio by making fun of his ears. Seriously. Anybody remember this? This is history. I mean, absolutely, he destroyed Jeb Bush for, for not being a fighter, not being rude and unkind. If you can't beat a guy's points, make fun of him. And that's precisely what people do with the individuals that accept or believe things by faith. They don't deal with facts. They don't say, okay, well, let me prove to you that Obama doesn't know what's going on. They don't deal with the issue. They deal with the person. In other words, you're a pagan to work to, to celebrate Christmas. You're just you're nothing but a pagan. That's why you're doing it. Well, we're way over on time. Yes. The ad hominem attack. Ad hominem. Yeah. How hominem uh, is attacking the person instead of dealing with the argument. And that's what's done with Christmas nowadays, folks. And I would say to you uh, that if somebody is going to destroy or undermine something that is really foundational to who you are and how you worship, that they better have facts. And the facts better be contemporary to the time. In other words, they're not going back to the time and the age and, set, and looking at who Herod Antipas was and looking at, uh, at uh, Archelaus, and they're not looking at the different individuals. Uh, they're not carefully understanding the three different... Okay, so, so we need to finish up today, and uh, we're going to have to finish it next week. We have three, three calendars that are used in the Scripture and in different places of the Scripture. You're able to look at the context and figure out the calendars, but understand the calendar that we use, which is the Julian calendar, which begins with the January, uh, begins with the January uh, beginning of the year. The Persian calendar, which begins with the Nisan or the month of March as the beginning of the year, and the Jewish calendar, which begins with the um, the uh, month of <coughs> Tishri, which is a new year. And then understand that there are also individuals and. Uh, and uh, uh, several people have ex had helped to explain that there are individuals that understand a year to be a period of uh, 360 days. You say, Pastor, a year is 365 point whatever amount of days that it is. Um, well, not everybody calculated it that way. It hasn't always been calculated that way. And so to make sense of these things uh, and to understand the Scripture of it, then... 
you have to understand the calendar is being used. So you have to know when Daniel and Daniel's day, you have to know um, in Nehemiah's day, what calendar those men would have been referring to when they refer to the time that the decree went forth to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, one last thing before we finish. I know I'm way over on time this morning. The 490 years which the men from the east referenced was from the beginning, as we see on... Where is it, where is it at? Where is it at? Where is it? Okay. Uh, when we see from, from this chart here on Xerxes' death and Artaxerxes' accession uh, to, the, to the throne. And this is when the decree would have been reiterated or re-researched when Nehemiah would have gone to rebuild the temple. So the question is, would it have been when Ezra went to rebuild the temple or when Nehemiah rebuilt the walls? What would have been the beginning of that 490 years? And uh, we'll answer that question next week. We don't have time. We're out of time this morning. So these are important questions. And the question is, what motivated seven wise men to... <laughs> Seven wise men to travel from the east and uh, to uh, seek the king of the Jews. I'll tell you what motivated them. The same thing that helped Daniel to understand uh, that the captivity was over. And that's that the scripture said this is when God would do it. Seventy years of captivity is what God declared. And that's what God, what they had. And when God told Daniel, 70 weeks of seven, 70 weeks minus minus one, so 490 years minus seven years, which is 483 years, this is when the, uh, this is when the, the uh, crucifixion will, where the Messiah will be cut off and this is when uh, Jerusalem will be destroyed and laid waste again. And that will introduce that period that is a waiting period now we know is the time of the church before God deals with His last week and, a stab, and all of these six prophecies in Daniel 9.25 will be fulfilled at the end of that last week, or at the midpoint, the three and a half of the last week. Okay. A lot of stuff, huh? You got your charts. Take them home, study them, look at them, and uh, look at the things that I've referenced, and they'll be a real help to you. And to help you to know that a lot of times people are just attacking, but they're not researching, they're not studying, and you can know things very, very specific just by studying the Word of God and um, getting in the know. And you'll be a real help to people that say, well, we don't even know that Jesus came at Christmas time. Well, I'm sorry, folks. We actually do. You don't know because you didn't study the Scripture. That's the reality of it. So, let's go ahead and dismiss the Word of Prayer. Father, thank You so much for Your Word that is so plain, so clear. And God, thank You for things that are there that are specifically written if we'll take the time to research and to, to study it. Lord, I pray that You would help us to seek from Your Word for wisdom as one seeks for hidden treasures. And God, we know that the promise of the Scripture is then we'll, we'll find those things. And I pray that You'd help us to be finders of truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, take about eight minutes. We're going to start about three minutes late, Charlie, uh, for service because I ran over this morning. You're dismissed. We'll be back in a few minutes.